Good morning, everyone. It's a blustery fall day outside, but it's uh, pretty warm and cozy and wind-free inside, except by the wind of the Spirit, which blows through here every Sunday. Welcome to everyone, including our folks at home. I want to welcome you warmly uh, to worship with us here at the Boundbrook Presbyterian Church. A couple of, and there's a, just a lot going on. I want to say there's a couple of brief announcements, but there are maybe more than a couple of brief announcements. And the first one begins with October 16th. That's just put that day on your calendar, reserve the whole day for the church. Here we go. If you have been visiting, whether online or here in person, we're offering an inquirer's gathering, a chance to get to know us better. Um, you might be interested in membership, um, but you don't have to join in order to come and learn about who we are. So on Sunday, uh, the 16th of October, right after worship, about 1130, at a place to be named later on this campus, we will gather uh, for those who are interested in learning more about what we do here and perhaps exploring membership at the church. If you are confined uh, to online membership, that's fine. We will make a Zoom option possible by request. So let the church office know that you're interested in the, in the gathering, first of all, and if you need a Zoom option, we will make that possible. In addition, Next slide. Uh, the ministerium has a number of ecumenical events happening beginning also coincidentally on the 16th of October. The ministerium is a collection of clergy uh, from a variety of the houses of worship here in Boundbrook. Uh, we're going to start on the 16th at 4 p.m. Everything happens at 4 p.m. so that's easy. Beginning the 16th of October and running all the way through the Sunday before Thanksgiving. First, a prayer walk. You'll need to be able to walk about a mile. Should take about an hour. And we'll go to some local areas, uh, say a prayer, no evangelism, just prayerfully loving our community and covering it in prayer. And then we have a series of four conversations on gratitude led by different members of the ministerium. So Reverend Kristen Foley from the Episcopal Church, Father Phil Ferrandino, we know him from the Dorothy Day House of Hospitality, Rabbi Stephen Whalen uh, at the local synagogue down the street, and of course, Monsignor Joseph Kerrigan from the Catholic Church, uh, St. Joseph's in town. So again, four o'clock. And then finally, on Sunday, November 20th, the Sunday before Thanksgiving, we'll have our community Thanksgiving service. All of these events happen here. We are gonna be the location for all of them. The classes will happen on our campus, the prayer walk will start here, and the worship service uh, for Thanksgiving is here as well. So I hope you'll put that on your calendar and join us. It's an exciting time to bond with our local community. Next, we have another event. On the, guess what, on the 16th of October, after you've gone on the prayer walk, you'll be ready to settle into the pews. We have uh, Shay Veloso, is that his name? Did I get that right? We have had him here before and he is a wonderful organist. He's going to do an organ recital here in our very sanctuary, and I hope you'll come and support that. We're excited about that, and it will be a great end to a wonderful day. So again, put all these things on your calendar. A reminder today is, is Communion Sunday. It is World Communion Sunday. Uh, that means folks throughout uh, the world, including the Protestants who tend to have their communion services once or twice in a month. We're all having communion together, reminding ourselves that the table of God is much bigger than our table. And in addition, we pick this Sunday for our peacemaking and global mission offering. It's a special denominational offering that supports all of our ministries related both domestically and internationally toward peacekeeping and global justice and global witness, plus 25% of the offering today will go uh, to the World Central Kitchen that is feeding Ukrainians displaced by war. So we hope that you'll support that. You need only put a memo uh, line in your check about uh, peacemaking offering, that'll do. Uh, there are also envelopes out on the round table if you want a special envelope, if you've got cash and you want it to go there. 
This is, of course, in addition to monies that we collect just to keep the lights on. So uh, I hope you will do what you can. Um, if we can have the next slide, I, I know there's so much going on in the world right now. So much suffering. We watched Ian blow through Florida and South Carolina and previous to that, Puerto Rico. You may feel it in your heart that you really want to financially contribute toward the recovery in those various areas, Puerto Rico, Florida, South Carolina, and Pakistan, which was devastated much earlier by its own storm. 60% of that country was devastated by their own weather uh, tragedy. So Presbyterian Disaster Assistance, which we know well because they've been here when we've had our own tragedies, our own weather-related disasters, they are now in all those places. It took them a while to be able to get into Pakistan, but they're there. They are also in Puerto Rico. They are also uh, mobilizing for assistance in Florida and South Carolina. And you can go online and donate toward them if you would like to do that, if you feel so called. And that's the website right there, pda backslash pcusa.org. Um, they, they will stick it out to the very end until all is well. Um, one more announcement. Help, help, help is needed after worship today. Courtney and the Sunday School program are moving uh, much of, of their equipment for Sunday School downstairs to our cave. And we're doing that because we are realizing that we are feeding more and more people in our food pantry every Sunday. And folks are coming earlier and earlier to get in line. And the building is filled even when the kids are over there. And we thought, just uh, as a precaution, uh, security, safety, and also for ease of use so that on a day like this, we can use the classroom to hold people as they wait instead of making them line up in the rain. We're gonna move uh, beginning next week, Sunday school will meet downstairs. Today, our children are actually going to assist in the setup for the pantry, and then they're coming over for Sunday school, or not Sunday school, for communion. But we need people after church to work with Courtney to get what needs uh, to be moved downstairs, downstairs. Uh, one shout out of uh, thanks, by the way. Uh, I'm thinking of John Almendinger and Betsy Hassreimer. I'm thinking about Cheryl Delita and Mark DeMuth, who stained a whole bunch of beautiful boards so that our ceiling could be put back together by the carpenter we hired, and now all is well. So when the bell rings, it won't be rung from a pre recorded bell ringing from some date in the past, but will be live and coming to you right from the bell tower um, and we're excited about that. Thank you to the folks who give of their time and make themselves available uh, to love and care for our building. Because it is a communion Sunday, I wanna go through the prayer concerns and there are many. Um, I received notice today that we will be praying for a man named Tim who is uh, a friend of Nancy Reynolds. He's recovering from kidney transplant uh, that he had this week. We are, of course, praying for those who are recovering from uh, Ian, from the, from the storm Ian. Uh, we're asked for prayers for the friend, friends and family of a woman named Barbara, who is a very close friend to Janet Homeland. Uh, she passed yesterday in the hospital. Uh, we're remembering Lorna Fletcher and her family on the loss of her mother. We're praying for Jean Heller, which is Bill's mom. Bill's up in the booth running our tech booth this Sunday. His mom was taken to the hospital this morning and we pray for her. Her name is Jean. Of course, we think of the people of Iran. If you're paying attention to what's happening there, there are a number of protests related uh, to human rights for women. And so I encourage you to pay attention to what's happening and support those folks who are standing up for women in Iran. Also the people of Ukraine, of course, and multiple people have asked me to pray generally for those struggling with COVID. A uh, number of our congregation are home and you may be out there and we are thinking about you because you've tested positive and you are in that period of isolation. We're praying for good health, for a return back to your friends and loved ones work and community. 
So there you have it. Um, let us prepare our hearts for worship now, mindful that it is the spirit that is in our midst as we hear this morning's prelude. We gather today to worship the one who created us, the one who equips us. With joyful hearts, let us worship God.
Spirit, come. Come, come into our hearts today. today. Let us pray. God of grace and wonder, we come to this time of worship grateful for all you have done for us. Grateful that you meet us here and are present by your Holy Spirit. Grateful we welcome we have received in the person Jesus Christ, who welcomes us to his holy table. Grateful for each other, for this community of support and friendship with whom we share this journey of faith. May we, with exuberance, praise you this day in song, in prayer, and in thought and service. In Jesus' name we pray.
let us join their voices and give praise to God. We love you, Jesus. Let us pray. Gracious God, give us humble, teachable, and obedient hearts that we may receive what you have revealed and do what you have commanded. Amen.
Let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. For you, Lord, are a great God and a great ruler above all gods. The sea is yours, for you made it, and your hands have molded the dry land. For the Lord is our God, and we are the people of God's pasture and the sheep of God's hand. At the time the epistle to the Hebrews was written, the Christian community had existed for a few decades. An enthusiasm that characterized its earlier years had begun to wane, and doubts were beginning to arise concerning any permanent significance that Christianity might have. It is in this climate that the epistle was written to strengthen the faith of Christians who were associated with this new movement. Listen for the Spirit speaking to us. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened up for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from all evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. Let us, and let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day is approaching. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. After the baptism and his temptation, Jesus returns to his hometown of Nazareth, where he attends a synagogue service. He is asked to read a portion of scripture. He reads from Isaiah 61, the gospel as attributed to Luke. When he came to Nazareth, he had been brought up. He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found a place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the release of the captives and recover the slight to the blind and to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. And then he began to say the, to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Just getting a good look at you. Kind of getting in the zone. Looking at Jesus with a thumbs up. 
knowing that the Spirit is in this place. It may seem like a throwaway phrase in Luke's Gospel, as was his custom. You heard Adriana read the story from Luke's Gospel. This is sort of the inaugural beginning of Jesus' ministry, but before what was just read, Jesus had spent 40 days and 40 nights preparing to go out into the world and bring the good news to proclaim the release of the captive and recovery of sight to the blind and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He was out in the wilderness 40 days and 40 nights, and he was tempted, but he prevailed, he resisted, and his resistance was for him strength. He was strengthened for what lied, what laid ahead for him. And then we read, then Jesus filled with the power of the Spirit, having resisted, Jesus filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country, and he began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. So Jesus is beginning to be that itinerant preacher that we know him to be, the itinerant rabbi of Judaism. And everywhere he goes, he goes to the synagogues in the towns where he arrives. And he began to teach in their synagogues, and he was praised by everyone. And when he came to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. There's that line. It was his habit. It was his discipline. He would enter a town, and he would go first to the place where people gathered to listen to the Spirit speaking to them. He'd go to the synagogue. He'd go where the community worshipped. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let's make a joyful noise to the Lord of our salvation. Let us come into God's presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to God with songs of praise. Uh, this is a communal call of the Psalter for the people to gather as a community and to worship communally. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. Uh, for the Lord is our God. And we are the people of God's pasture and the sheep of God's hand. Worship, broadly speaking, much like divine revelation. Thanks, George. I want to make sure you're with me. Not just... When the Spirit says, you know, I'm coming, it's got to open the door. Last week we talked about, well, a couple weeks ago, we talked about revelation in this Back to the Basics, and we said there's sort of a, a general revelation, very broad, that we see in the creation. We know the creator, the creative God, by the things that God has made. And very specifically, we know more about God through the testimony of God in the scriptures and the person, the living word of God in Jesus Christ. Uh, similarly, Worship is both a very broad and general experience and also uh, a very narrow and defined experience. I love Frederick Beekner. He passed recently, which is a great loss. But a prolific writer, and he writes about worship. To worship God means to serve God, basically. There are two ways to do it, broad and specific. One way is to do things for God, to do the things that God needs to be done. To run errands for God, to carry messages for God, to set up the pantry across the way for God, to feed God, to be generous with people in kindness and in giving, and in forgiveness, to do the things that God needs done in the world. That's a form of worship in the broadest sense. Okay, the other way, he writes, is to do things for God that you need to do for God. What might those things be that you need to do for God, that I need to do for God? Well, he writes, sing songs for God. 
create beautiful things for God. Give up things for God. Tell God what's on your mind and in your heart. In general, rejoice in God and make a fool of yourself for God in the way lovers have always made fools of themselves for the one they love. You ever made fool for yourself, of yourself for love? Let's just stop and tell stories. No. Broadly defined, worship is anything that we do in the service of God, broadly, and everything narrowly we do in response to what God's done for us. Both are essential. Worship is our Sabbath gathering. Now we're narrowing in on the narrowly defined component of worship, which will now be our focus for today. It's our Sabbath gathering. It's the community in one place, sort of, right? Haven't we just blown the roof off what it means to be in one place? Because we have you, and you are far away in cyberspace, and we have you, and you are warming the seats of the pews and warming each other with your presence. We gather at an appointed place, at an appointed time, doing what we need to do, what our souls require, what love requires, which is to rejoice in the presence of the one who has been so loving and kind. The very one we said at the beginning of this, back to the basics, values us and infuses us with the divine image, the stamp of the creator, because God loves us so. We rejoice in the presence of the one who gives us life and life abundant. Mind you, our gatherings are not defined by where we gather. So <clears throat> do you know that we have gale force wind warning today? If it blows over this building, we will still be the church. This is a sacred moment and it's a sacred place, not because the building is beautiful, it's beautiful and the windows are Tiffany and whatever. It's sacred because you're here and I'm here. It is the gathering of people that makes this a sacred moment. Wherever two or three are gathered, wherever. So it's sacred on ASP and it's sacred over there even in the gym where they're setting up for the food pantry. It's sacred at the men's prayer breakfast that happens weekly. It's sacred wherever we might be where two or three are gathered and aware of and celebrating what God's done among us. We can gather anywhere. What defines our worship is that we are together in all the different ways that we now can be together. We're here because we believe in something bigger than ourselves. Some days we don't feel it. Some days, some of you are here and you don't feel it now, but you're longing to feel it. And some of us have been in that place and we are just kind of oozing with enthusiasm for it. And part of the benefit of being together is those who are feeling it can hold up those who aren't. Or, the kids can begin to sing and we all feel it. And we realize that we're intergenerationally a part of something that's been handed down generation to generation into our laps and now handed over to our children so even they can lead us in worship, which is amazing. We're here to recognize what God's doing in and among and through us. We're here to praise God and to give God thanks for all our many blessings. And we're here to have some words with God because life is also difficult. And by communicating our needs in prayer, we are growing in our relationship corporately as the people of God. As important as it is for you to do this at home, it's equally important for the people of God to do it together. Male and female, God created them. And you know what the Bible says? It wasn't 
good for man to be alone in the second creation story. So it's retold such that God creates community in order for a man not to be alone. And that's not gender specific. Don't worry about it. The point is simple. It's not about getting married. It's about being in community. Jesus always sought community, as was his custom, in the synagogue, in the towns, gathering the people. Sure, he went off to a mountain to be alone and recoup, but guess what? He brought his community with him. The disciples would travel with him up the mountain because we are better together and our faith is enlivened when we are in this setting having this moment. We listen for the Spirit speaking when we're here, don't we? We midrash the scriptures. That's my, I just love the idea that we can use our imaginations, that we're invited to dialogue with the scriptures so that we can be in this moment listening for the Spirit speaking to us. There are other things that we do when we're together. We celebrate new life. Whether it's the new life of the newly born, or the new life of an adult newly engaged in a life of faith. We celebrate at this table. We feed on the story that we might be extended grace. And we'll talk more about sacraments when we go to the table later on, but what a powerful thing. This is a thin place. That ancient Celtic idea that there are moments when people gather when we are not far from the heavens. This is a thin place. Now, how are we to behave? This is such a weird setup for that word. And I, I say that because we've told this before, Kierkegaard talks about challenging the notion of really how we set up our sanctuary and worship together. Kierkegaard said that, you know, worship's kind of like a drama, it's like a play. But the question is, who's the audience? Who are the actors? Who's directing the play? And at first glance, you would say that the congregation's the audience, because it looks, doesn't it look like you're the audience? Here you are, and here we are, and the actors, or the choir, and the children, and Adriana and myself, and we're trying to create for you an experience in the drama, which is faith, and the director would be God, but Kierkegaard said, wait a minute, no, maybe not. This is the worship of God, so maybe God is the audience, and you're the actors, and we simply are helping direct this worship of the community heavenward, and that's kind of a helpful image, even though our physical setup kind of says otherwise. But the truth of the matter is, we all have a role to play in what happens in this room or in homes online every Sunday. But the one issue that I have with Kierkegaard is that the idea that God is simply audience makes God passive. And our God is not passive. The Spirit speaks. God moves. Christ is present. And that's why we come. That's why we come. Eugene Peterson, another uh, uh, saint of the written theology, writes, Worship is the strategy by which we interrupt our preoccupation with ourselves and attend to the presence of God. The most important thing you, or you, or I can do, in fact, it's why I paused this morning, it was a little bit of a weird morning, just to put myself out of the center of what I was doing. And to put God before my face, so that I could be where I needed to be to be with you in this moment. That's your job, too. When you come and sit in the pews, when you get ready, you know, we're all like chit-chatty with uh, each other because we love each other and we are so happy to see each other and some of us are carrying out business in the sanctuary, fine. But there should be a moment. Maybe it's as the prelude is happening or the prayer of invocation where we take 
ourselves out of the center of our experience and present open hearts and open minds to the God among us. Frederick Buechner went on to write, now I, I don't want to confuse you, we had Frederick Buechner at the beginning and just Eugene Peterson and back to Frederick Buechner, part of the same quote, this is rough. A Quaker meeting or a pontifical high mass, the family service at the Presbyterian church or a holy roller happening, he writes. Ever been to a holy roller happening? I think we need to have one of those. Unless there's an element of joy and foolishness in the proceedings, he says you'd be better off doing something else. Because what he's saying is part of worship is being vulnerable being fully present, to clap your hands. I know we're Presbyterians, and we don't really know how to bodily worship, so we just kind of sway. But you guys are loosening up to the hand clapping. It's awesome. It's very exciting. And when we sing Lord of the Dance, you almost dance. Almost. But the idea is that this should be the safe space where we can let loose. Where when we celebrate a life that's passed, if you want to bawl your eyes out, you can bawl your eyes out. And then in the next breath, give thanks for the promise of eternal life. Or when a baby's presented for baptism, if you want to tear up, tear up. This is our emotional space. Not just our intellectual space for conversation like this, but to both hear and feel the spirit moving among us. I love that uh, Adriana chose to tease up the, or not tease up, that's not what I wanted to say. <laughs> Tee up is what I meant to say. The epistle to the Hebrews and the whole idea that this was a church that was now decades beyond the Jesus event that was going through what kind of naturally happens. You have a big moment, and you try to maintain that moment, and then life gets in the way, and the feelings start to dissolve, and you start to wonder, did you make up that moment? Have you ever had that feeling in faith where you just, you know, you'd had such a tight, exciting, exuberant faith, and the years go by, and life happens, and you start to feel just a little bit distant. And the writer says, let us consider how to Provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but all the more encouraging one another as the day approaches. There's a little bit of a crisis going on in American Christianity. We don't know how to come back from COVID. Our pews are a little less packed than they used to be. We have folks who are watching from a distance and we try to be mindful that you're there and there is power and energy in that. But there are also plenty of folks who got so used to having a different sort of Sunday morning that they're trying to do all their spiritual worship solo. And I think that's a grave mistake. Attendance, not just here, I mean in general. I think we need to really understand what we value about this moment. And now I'm preaching to the choir, not you. But in general, you know the saying, as the saying goes, because you're here. But we want to be inviting back those who haven't found their way back to us yet. Because something special is happening here. Let Jesus' custom be our very own. Thanks be to God.
The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. We extend that peace to our friends uh, in cyberspace, and we encourage everyone to extend that peace to each other as you see fit following the service. It is that time where part of our worship is the generosity of spirit that moves us to give our time in volunteer service, to give our talent that the church might continue to reach more and more folks with good news and with loving kindness and also with our treasure that we might be able to do the things that the spirit leads us to do. So again, a reminder, we're collecting our peacemaking offering in addition to our regular uh, operating budget offering. Folks at home, you can give online, you can give through Easy Tithe at the church website, bvpc.org uh, backslash give, I believe. Let us worship God with our gifts.
you know, talking about being able to worship both with the mind and the body. I'm watching the kids, and uh, apparently it was raining when they came over, so there was a little bit of this going on. But I could see them moving to the music as you were singing and as Ben was playing, because music, doesn't it? It moves you, and it should move you, unless you're Presbyterian, and then maybe not, but... <laughs> but the whole point, again, behind an anthem like that is to raise us up. And so here we are at the Lord's table. Uh, it is a place of sacrament, coming from the word sacred, meaning God present in a meaningful and unique way. Some have called the sacraments, both baptism and the Lord's Supper, a, a grace that can be touched. This is what it touches or feels like, grace. It feels like a simple piece of bread. It tastes like a little bit of juice or wine, whatever you got at home. Grace feels like water sprinkled on a new life, whether it's a new life or a life made new as an adult. John Calvin called what we're doing here visible words. Visible words. Augustine said it's an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. Which all is to say I can't explain it. But I know when I participate in it, something has happened and I've encountered God in a real way. So we're invited and the table stretches much beyond here. It's worldwide, kids. Remember we got the globe? Because everyone is invited to the table. It's a table of grace. And these, my friends, are the gifts of God for the people of God. Let us be fully present unto them. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks and praise the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing a spiritually necessary thing to join our voices with all who've come before, who've sat in these very pews or who around the world have believed and celebrated in this way and with all who will come after us long after we're gone. We continue to sing this hymn in this moment. Lord, we pray that we will have the courage and the vulnerability to come as we are and understand that we've been made welcome, that the metaphorical chair is waiting for us, that we might gather around and be fed in this spiritual meal, that this tangible bread broken and this cup poured will be for us in remembrance of Christ's body broken and blood shed, that we might experience this abundant life that gives and gives and gives us hope and grace and strength, that we might be your people in the world. Lord, we give you thanks for our children, for each other, for the gift of community, that we might sit around this table together. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
You know the story from Scripture. On the night that Jesus was betrayed at the table, he blessed, he said grace, and he broke the bread. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup said this is the new covenant, God doing something new in my blood. Blood being the symbol of life, so his life becomes something new for us. As often as you drink this, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. So as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup in this way, together and apart, but fully around the Lord's table, we are remembering and feeding on, and being nourished by, and being made whole until Christ comes again. And Christ comes again and again. We've seen him in each other and in the circumstances of our communal life together. So friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come take, eat.
Let us pray. Lord, give, we give you thanks for the simplicity of your sacraments, for this table of welcome and for uh, a worldwide remembrance of how extravagant your love is. That even in the life of Jesus Christ, we could find new life, resurrection life, in a body broken and a cup poured for us. We give you thanks for how powerful it is to see one another share in that body and blood of Christ. Whether we come forward or we serve loved ones in the pews to watch our children, to hear the music of the choir, we are in a thin place right now. And so we feel free, as we would at any table where we sit with loved ones to share with you our loved one, our concerns. We pray for all the pockets and places in the world struggling to recover from storm damage, and there are so many places and so many people, and some are grieving not only the loss of home but the loss of life. We pray for the places where people are standing up for more justice for human rights. We think of the demonstrations happening in Iran. We pray for the people of the Ukraine and for a war-torn situation that is so painful to watch. Lord, in your mercy, hear our fervent prayers. We pray for our loved ones. There are so many on our list and those new folks that we've mentioned today. We Pray for Barbara's friends and family, particularly for Jan Homeland, as they gather around and grieve the loss of their friend Barbara. Lord, in your mercy, be with them. We pray for uh, Lorna Fletcher and her family on the loss of her mother, that she may feel the comfort of the spirit and the loving arms and support of friends. We pray for the Heller family, particularly for Jean uh, at this t uncertain time in the hospital that you will be with her and for Tim recovering from kidney transplant surgery, Lord, in your mercy. And for all of those with COVID, it just doesn't stop. But we pray for mild cases and negative tests and a return to life as normal, whatever that means. Lord, we pray that we too as the church will understand what the new normal will be for us and how it is that we can continue to value this perhaps culturally uncool thing gathering on a Sunday morning here in these pews or by screen, that we might love you together and feel your presence among us. Be with us, we pray, in the name of Jesus who taught us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We decided to make Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place, our closing hymn, which is why we're not standing up to sing right this moment, but instead a benediction. As was Jesus' custom, may it also be our custom to continue to be in this place and to expect God to do great things and to expect that we will show up for God and each other to love and support enthusiastically when we can and faithfully, even when it's hard, to worship in body and in mind and in spirit. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit allow us to do this thing. Amen.